memory, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a benef there's benefit to having memory. Now, obviously, moving forward, I don't think having a strong memory is as beneficial as it used to be because nowadays you got Google, ChatGBT, Grok. There's so many easy things like people who used to be able to memorize things, that's no longer as a, just like calculators came out and those who can do math in their, in their mind, great, you can do it, anybody else can do it. It's a great mm -hmm. equalizer, right? But there's still benefits in having a good memory. No question. What helps, what can you do to strengthen? I have an exercise I do, but I'm curious to know to the average person that's thinking, how can I improve my memory? What can you do? Well, there's three things you can do to improve your memory. I mean, first of all, I would lower your glycemic profile. I would dramatically reduce um, sugar and carbohydrate intake. Not, not, not go keto, not go Atkins, uh, you know, or carnivore per se. But we know now that Alzheimer's is type three diabetes. If you put in type, just because I know he's going to Google it, so I might as well just <laughs> <laughs> get ahead of him. Type three diabetes, um, yeah, or type three diabetes, Alzheimer's. Boom. Um, the term type three diabetes is. is uh, they say that it's not recognized as a um, similarity between type two diabetes and Alzheimer's. If you if you keep scrolling down, interesting. Um, they hypothesize that Alzheimer's disease may be a form of type three diabetes that mm. specifically affects the brain because you know a lot of uh, people don't realize this. It's not just the pancreas that makes insulin. The brain is so crack addicted to um, sugar that it can make its own insulin, um, and so um, and what the brain wants, the brain gets when the brain craves sugar. Um, it will activate dopamine receptors on the back of the tongue. I think they're the RF1A2 receptors so that it gives you a sort of a reward for giving it sugar. So we know that insulin resistance in the brain, um, there's evidence to support the connection between insulin resistance and Alzheimer's. So insulin resistance in the brain, um, you know, when you, when you don't have places to store sugar in the body, we convert sugar into something called glycogen. We store it in the liver. In the brain, there's no place to store it. There are neurosynaptic junctions, these little spaces between nerves. So insulin resistance has a massively negative impact on the brain. So before I tell you what to take to improve um, memory, it's what to not do to improve your memory. So you want to lower your glycemic profile, so lower your blood sugar, um, your your what's called your hemoglobin A1C, the three month average of your blood sugar, will do a lot for your cognitive function. That's why if you ever notice how sharp you are and awake and alert and aware when you're fasted, or when you're hungry, like when you're hungry and you're going searching for food, you're actually on your game. You feel alert. You feel awake. You feel focused. You feel cognizant. You feel clear. Why is that? Because your blood sugar is low, and so. Um, on the low side. So the lower you can keep your hemoglobin A1C, you know, and a really good hemoglobin A1C is 5.2, 5.3 or less. Um, and the more insulin sensitive you are, the sharper your memory is going to be. Um, the second thing is that memory is directly related to um, circulation. The presence of oxygen is the absence of disease. And as you deprive the brain of oxy oxygen, which is called hypoxia, which by the way is the definition of death, hypoxia, lack of oxygen to the brain, but as you just take marginal deficits in the amount of oxygen in the brain, you take significant deficits in your cognitive function. So mobility, exercise, breathing um, will do more for your cognitive function than any kind of neurotropic because you will increase the circulation to the brain. And a lot of people don't realize that you can also improve the capacity for your blood to carry oxygen by managing your levels of red blood cells and hemoglobin. So for example, the reason why hormone therapy may improve or does improve cognitive function, like when, when men that are deficient um, begin in, in testosterone, for example, or women that are deficient in testosterone get on testosterone replacement therapy, or they fix the nutrient deficiencies like DHEA and D3 that cause hormone deficiency, their cognitive function returns or their memory improves or their short-term recall improves. And why is that? Because when you normalize the hormone level, you normalize or increase the level of red blood cells, which carry oxygen, and it brings more oxygen to the brain. This is why testosterone deficient men have memory issues. Testosterone, men that are not deficient in testosterone that, that have, have a tendency to have less um, memory issues. So hormone therapy can be a big, play a big role in cognitive function. HRT or TRT? Oh, no question. If you, I know he's going to do it anyway, so we might as well just do it. But if you go to the Journal of American Urology, which is considered the Bible for male endocrine therapy, just go to Journal of American Urology, testosterone, um, and then open that and scroll down to line 
uh, 13, where it says counseling regarding testosterone deficiency. Um, uh, did you say Journal of American Urology? <clears throat> there you go. Oh, that was it. Okay, so scroll down to line 13, uh, number 13. It, oh, it, sorry. Is that the actual? Wait, that's not the actual study. Journal of American Urology Testosterone. Go back, Rob, if you can go back. Journal of it American allowed you that Urology just test Right there on the bottom testosterone. of testosterone. Yeah, Bum. there you go. Boom. Okay. Um, evaluation and management of testosterone deficiency. Okay, that, this is, the, by, by the way, this is one of the, the better peer-reviewed published journals in the world on male endocrine therapy. So we're going to go to the Bible for a second. Keep scrolling down until you get to line, line 13, which will say um, counseling regarding the management of testosterone deficiency. Um, 13, there we go. Counseling regarding the treatment of testosterone deficiency, sorry. Uh, so, so this is what a physician should say to a patient that is deficient in testosterone if they're thinking of taking testosterone therapy. Clinicians should inform testosterone deficient patients that low testosterone is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, not the other way around. Um, if you scroll down again, uh, patients should be informed that testosterone therapy may result in improvements in erectile function, low sex drive, anemia, bone mineral density, lean body mass, and or depressive symptoms. The reason why all of these are affected by all of these, energy, fatigue, lipid profiles, quality of life, cognitive function, right there, um, is because, and if you, if you go further into the studies, and I won't bore you with those, but um, is because you are improving the, the presence of oxygen in the bloodstream. And so the more oxygen you have, the better your cognitive function. So first I would lower my sugars. I would try to maintain you know, uh, low, uh, low levels of high glycemic sugars in, in, my, in my blood. I would, if you are young, you, wouldn't, you shouldn't start hormone therapy, but you should have your hormone levels checked and see if you are deficient in the nutrients that your body needs to make hormones. Mm. About 70% of uh, you know, patients that qualify for hormone therapy don't need hormones. They need the nutrients that the body needs to make hormones. So if you're de clinically deficient, for example, in DHEA, or you have high levels of something called SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin, um, or you're clinically deficient in vitamin D3, these are nutrients that affect the, the, the production, metabolism, and conversion of the hormone mm -hmm. testosterone. And if we don't look at these things, we, we put people on hormone therapy too early, rather than putting them on the nutrients to make their own hormones. And so I just wanted to show you this because this is a... So I, this reminds me of the book I read many years <clears throat> ago, Ageless Man. I don't know if you've heard about the mm -hmm. book Ageless Man. It's, uh, they did the study on, uh, 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 was it rats? Or I don't know what they were testing on to see how your testosterone being lower uh, affects your heart attacks, your, your heart There's and 10, how... 10,000 receptors for testosterone right. in the heart alone. Yeah, th this is actually the book, by the way. Yeah, this is, uh, that's the book. That's the book that it came out about okay. eight years ago. Uh, it's very interesting when uh, uh, it's not a popular book. It's not something that you know. You, it's got I, I, seventy-two. I haven't reviews. read it, but it was actually a very interesting book to read to understand a little bit more about. Uh, zoom in a little bit on the cover of the book, Rob. How to cure preventive disease oh, of gosh, aging, Alzheimer's, this. depression, Parkinson, hypertension, coronary, co uh, coronary disease, heart infarct, slip disc, prostate impotence, knee. I mean, it's like all of it, and it's a simple book. It's not a big book to read. You, you know what's amazing about that is that. This is exactly what we discovered in our, in our um, research in mortality is that so often, so many things go wrong. So if you just look at that myriad of symptoms, mm -hmm. right? Hypertension, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cholesterol, obesity, slip disc, prost you know, uh, prostate impotence, hip, hip osteoarthritis, that seems like the entire world's going to hell in a handbasket, mm. right? So if you treat these like spokes on a wheel, these look like independent variables all going wrong. There's a cardiac issue, there's a mental issue, there's a bone issue, there's a circulatory issue, there's a cognitive issue. There's one issue causing everything. And this is what happens, in, 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 and I believe goes lost on modern medicine very often, is usually one thing goes wrong that causes everything. You don't have multiple systems going wrong, right? I mean, I, you know, people that have an autoimmune disease tend to have multiple autoimmune diseases. Why is that? Because it's a failure of the immune system, or not a failure of the immune system, immune system is usually acting properly because we don't go and find out why the immune system is attacking our tissue. Probably 40% of your audience listening to this podcast right now has some form 
of autoimmune condition, autoimmune thyroid, Hashimoto's, Crohn's, uh, Chagrin's, all, you know, a whole number of things. And, and, and what modern medicine would have you believe is that, you know, you, you woke up one day and your immune system is, is attacking your tissues, right? So, so if you have Crohn's disease, uh, you woke up one day and your immune system started manufacturing antibodies to your colon. Or if you have Hashimoto's, you woke up one day and the immune system started to attack your thyroid. And we immediately assume that the immune system has gone wrong, that the immune system's made a mistake. So we need to suppress the immune system and we need to put anti-inflammatories in the body. Instead of saying, let's just assume that God didn't make a mistake. Let's just assume that the immune system is acting properly. We just need to find out why. So in other words, it's attacking the cold, colon, yes, but it's doing it for a reason. Let's figure out why. And the big whys are mold, mycotoxin, metals, viruses, parasites, mm -hmm. those five. You test for those five, you will get to the root of, in my opinion, the majority of all autoimmune conditions. But we believe that autoimmune conditions happen because the immune system is spontaneously dysfunctional. There are so many people with autoimmune Hashimoto's, and what do they do? They just put them on medication and watch the immune system just slowly attack, you know, the thyroid. But the truth is when, when you have when you have pathogens in the body like mold, a mycotoxin, a, a, a virus, a, a parasite, and you have a healthy cell, and I, if they're listening to this, they can't see this, but um, pathogens don't hide like this, right? They hide like this. So in other words, let's say that this is a, a virus, a mycotoxin or heavy metal, um, and it's floating around the bloodstream. It's not going to hide outside of the cell. It's going to hide inside of the cell. Mm. Now, the immune system sees this invader. How does it get to that pathogen? It manufactures an antibody to your cell to get to this. It's not after this cell. It's not after your thyroid. But if you take heavy metals and you embed them in your thyroid tissue, your immune system will manufacture auto to antibodies to the tissue to get to this. So it's just like if... if you know, if a crime is committed and and the offender ran into your building and locked the door, the police would bust that door down to get to the offender. The immune system will do the same thing. It will bust through the wall of your cell by manufacturing an antibody to get to the invader. Mm. It's not after the cell. It's not after the friendly tissue. It's after the invader. So why don't we support the immune system and say, hey, why did I wake up one day and I have autoimmune antibodies to my thyroid? Well, maybe you have heavy metals embedded in the thyroid, right? Maybe you have mold, mycotoxin. Uh, so I... I, I I always, you know, try to preach that there's there's so much hope for us, um, you know, by getting back to the basics, nutrifying the body, putting the raw materials in that God gave us to 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 allow our bodies to to function properly. And as soon as something goes wrong, not assuming that you've had a disease or pathology happen to you, that something deficient has happened within you, fixing that deficiency can fix that condition. Nowadays, more than ever, the brand you wear reflects and represents who you are. So for us, if you wear a Future Looks Bright hat or a value taming gear, you're telling the world, I'm optimistic, I'm excited about what's going to be happening, but you're a free thinker, you question things, you like debate. And by the way, last year, 120,000 people got a piece of Future Looks Bright gear with Valuetainment. We have so many new things. The cufflinks are here. New Future Looks Bright. This is my favorite, the green one. Just yesterday, somebody placed an order for 100 of these. If you watch the PBD podcast, you got a bunch to choose from. White ones, black ones. If you, if you, if you smoke cigars and you come to our cigar lounge, we have this high quality lighter cutter and a holder for the cigars. We got sweaters. With the Vitamin logo on it, we got mugs. We got a bunch of different things. But if you believe the future looks bright, if you follow our content and what we represent with Vitamin, with, with PVD Podcast, go to vtmerch.com. And by the way, if you order right now, there's going to be a special VT gift insight just for you. So again, go to vtmerch.com, place your order, tell the world that you believe the future looks bright. If you enjoy this video, you want to watch more videos like this, click here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, Click here.